So welcome everybody to the book launch of uh, Stefan Harding's new book, Dr. Stefan, I should say, and that's Gaia Alchemy, The Reuniting of, of Science, Psyche and the Soul. And uh, I'm delighted to say that as well as Stefan today, we're also joined by Satish Kumar and Jules Cashford, who I hope you can all see on the screen at the moment. I'll hand over first to Satish, please, to give a, a little introduction, and then we'll hear from Stefan in more detail. But before I do that, I'd just like to ask everyone to, um, while, while the talk's going on, feel free to drop your questions in the chat box um, to this webinar. And once we've um, finished the talk, we'll leave 10 minutes or so to, to answer those questions, and I'll, I'll read them out to, to the group here. So, so do pop your, your questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, Satish, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, uh, thank you, Will. It is my great pleasure to be part of this uh, book launch by Stefan, my good friend. Uh, <clears throat> Stefan and I have been working together for the past 30 years. And with my experience, I can say that Stefan is a marvelous teacher, a great writer, and a wonderful person. And Stefan had worked with great scientists like James Lovelock for many years. And James Lovelock and Stefan co collaborated on Gaia uh, hypothesis and Gaia theory. And then uh, Stefan has also worked with RNS on deep ecology and with people like Frisjof Capra. And his first book was um, <clears throat> Animate Earth. And that's the first time that a book articulated the wonderful idea uh, as in Gaia that Earth is alive, Earth is intelligent, Earth is a living being. And that was a wonderful idea. I think Stefan has taken Gaia theory a step further, uh, even further than James Lovelock. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say uh, it is a great book. And then now, even better than the first book is Gaia Alchemy. Not only um, uh, Gaia is a living Earth, but it also connects with science, but spirituality and soul and psyche and alchemy. It is a wonderful book. And Stefan has accomplished tremendous uh, by writing these two books. But today we are launching Gaia Alchemy. And in these 30 years, Stefan has taught so many wonderful students in holistic science. And those students have gone out in the world and making great change, a great transformation. They, they are leading the environmental movement. And so it is a great pleasure, what accomplishment, what achievement Stefan has done in his um, 30 years of teaching at Schumacher College. I would say that Stefan is a star teacher of Schumacher College. And so it is with great joy and pleasure I invite uh, Stefan to speak to us about the thesis and the gist of the Gaia alchemy to inspire our listeners. And I hope that at the end, all of you who are listening and participating in the seminar will buy the copy of this book. This is one of the, one of the greatest book of our time. Thank you. So now I invite Stefan to speak to us about his book. Stefan, ah. over to you. Right. Well, thank you, Satish. That's a, a marvellous introduction. I mean, really, it's fantastic. And also, um, welcome to Jules, who I'll introduce in a minute. I and mean, Jules is, a, is an incredibly important person who helped me a lot with this book. And Will is also wonderful, helped, helping to set all this, this up for today. So and welcome, everybody, everyone who's joined. So now I'm going to take a big risk and share my screen. And the plan is, um, I'll talk for about 20 minutes about the book and then Jules and I will engage in, she'll ask me some questions and we'll engage in discussion and if Satish wants to join, he can. Uh, and then we'll take questions from you at the end for about 10, 15 minutes or longer if you want. <clears throat> so that's the plan. Hope you can all see the screen. You should be able to see it. There's the cover of the book. You see there's, there's Gaia giving us nurturing. nurturing. This is an old alchemical image from Atalanta Fugiens from the 17th century. And here's another one. So now, this is me, believe it or not. When I was a, a young scientist uh, at the Sengwe Research Area in Zimbabwe in 1972, I was, doing this, I was doing ecological research work. I was helping with work on elephants and warthogs. And I was doing science. Uh, I was doing ecology. But I felt there was something really missing from ecology because it was all about fact. 
You see, it was just about fact. You should say fact. Come on, computer, fact, fact. Oh gosh, there we go. It's all about fact. So never mind. There we are. About fact. Um, there. But what about values? There were no values in the science I was doing. Um, I want to. I wanted to ask deeper questions, but um, no one in science was interested. We we're just interested in the facts. So um, later on, I discovered when I came to Schumacher College, I met Arnie Ness, and he gave came came up with the term deep ecology. And he put the word deep in front of ecology so that we would focus on values as well as facts. And when we put them together, we get wisdom, ecosophy. So um, in my journey um, here at Schumacher and beyond, and earlier than before I came here, I ran into the work of Carl Gustav Jung, the, the, Jung, the great Swiss psychologist and his, his student, and then also great psychologist, Marie-Louis von Franz. And they became very interested. Oh, and also more <coughs> recently, my friend Jeffrey Keel, who's a Guyan scientist of a high order and climate scientist and a Jungian analyst, he helps help me hugely with this book on oh, Guy Alchemy. So I really want to mention Jeffrey. Um, so I realized that if I wanted to find value, I, uh, I could do that through alchemy. It seems very strange, but I felt very connected to alchemy as soon as I started reading in depth. And the alchemists were looking for the facts of nature. You see, they were, they were burning things and dissolving things, real physical chemical substances. And they were looking into the facts of nature, but they were also looking for values at the same time. They were searching for wisdom. They were searching for what they call the philosopher's stone. And they thought that by doing this kind of physical work with nature, they could discover the deepest philosophy, the deepest connection, the deepest soul of nature in themselves and in matter at the same time. So of course I found that really interesting. These were the precursors of science um, and they received images uh, from nature herself. Now here's, here's Jung's basic understanding of the psyche. So we have our consciousness, our conscious mind and our four functions, our thinking, feeling, sensing and intuition in the surface this is what we're aware of. Below our conscious awareness, we have our personal unconscious but even deeper than that, we have the collective unconscious where the archetypes live. And this, this is an autonomous region, which, if you like, is nature herself speaking to us through images. So nature gives us images if we are able to plunge ourselves down into the depths of the collective unconscious. We find there are living images that want to help us to become as fully human and as fully connected to nature as we can. Now, this isn't just some crazy idea of Jung's. He has empirical evidence for this. And many, many people, thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, have, have discovered uh, that this the tremendous psychological benefits of working in this way. And the alchemists did as well. So um, here are some of the alchemical images which the alchemists received from the collective unconscious, from the depths, as they worked on um, understanding nature. Um, they, they were proto-chemists. Their science wasn't terribly good in modern terms, but they, they discovered what they, what they found was they were so open. They had no prejudices. They were so open to nature that nature responded to them with images like this. This is the green lion eating the sun. And the image here is telling the alchemist, if you want to go really deep into things, then you have to, at one stage, you have to swallow your intellect. This, the sun is the intellect. You have to dissolve the intellect into the unconscious. This is what you have to do. This is the unconscious speaking. It's not someone who invented the image. We receive, the alchemists receive the image from nature herself, from the unconscious. Notice there are seven stars here along the lion's body. That's going to become very significant. This is another huge alchemical image, which says everything about alchemy. The, the uh, tabula smaragdina. I won't go into it, but you can see the point is, that this wasn't invented by the alchemists. This was given to them from nature herself, by nature herself, from the depths of the unconscious. And there's so much here to meditate on. This is a gift from the unconscious, which they, the alchemists received because they were working with matter, because they were working with physical substances. Nature liked that, and they received, they received these images. Just very briefly, here in the middle is the alchemist. He's a mixture of the light and the dark. You see the masculine, the feminine, the yin and the yang. Same on both sides, but we haven't got time to go into that now. So you could say that what the alchemists discovered or what was revealed to them was we might call what we might call the anima mundi, which is uh, the soul of the world. Anima means soul. Mundi means of the world. And um, this is something that it's 
fundamental to our humanity to see the world um, as ensouled, as, as an image maker, as a communicator through images, as something very deep, powerful, and meaningful. It's the anima mundi, the soul of the world. Those images that I showed you are part of the soul of the world. And all the traditional cultures of, of the world, and indeed our own culture <clears throat> with the alchemists, knew that, this, that the anima mundi was a fact. Mm. There was no doubt about it. The anima mundi was a fact. Everyone knew that trees had spirits and stones could speak to you, like Shakespeare said, you know, tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones. Everyone knew that it was obvious. But then we had the scientific revolution and the revolution, as Rupert Sheldrake points out, was to overturn this ancient animistic view of the earth and instead replace it with this mechanistic view in which, says Descartes, um, the whole earth and the whole universe is nothing more than a machine. That's all it is, it's a machine. He didn't like, he and his followers didn't like the idea that there was a soul in nature. There was a soul in humans, of course, you know, in our brain through the pineal gland, we were connected to God, the male mathematician, the sky god mathematician, who set up the world like a machine and then set it running. So if we knew all the precise details of all the cogs and all the ratios and all the mathematical relationships, we could control the entire planet for our own benefit. Um, so we lost the soul of the world. That was the scientific revolution. The revolution was to kick out the anima mundi, kick out Gaia, kick out soulfulness in the world, apart from in ourselves. That was the only place there was soul. And he said, there's the soulful stuff in here that the res cogitans, only humans have, and the res extenso, the dead stuff of nature out there, the mechanistic view of nature, which of course took over our culture. It was a very successful revolution. And 400 years later, it's no surprise that we get these tremendously dangerous effects that we're seeing now with our climate. Here's the average global temperature over the last um, 200, well, over the last 2000 years or so. And you can see that now we're actually about here, incredibly dangerous um, warming of the planet leading to fires like this and droughts um, and terrible effects that are only going to get worse because, of we, because we've lost the anima mundi, because we've lost the soul of the world. So the alchemists then have something very important to tell us, even though we consider them primitive, especially in the, in the scientific realm, they're considered primitive and useless scientists and you know, fantasists of nothing, nothing of value to offer us. Well, I think that's, I'm a scientist and I think that's wrong. Um, they have a lot to offer us, a great deal to offer us. And we have to combine what they have to offer us with our science. And that's what I've done in this book, Guy Alchemy. I've tried to, to combine certain alchemical ideas and insights and images with some of the science from, of Gaia, from the hard science of Gaia, to try and bring soul into science again. So here's one of the images that I've been working with a lot in the book, <clears throat> which I want to share with you now. It's called the Azoth the Philosoph, as you can see, 1659. And notice there's a lot going on in this picture. We're just going to focus on the central image, the mandala in the middle. We haven't got time to go into the rest of it. But notice that there's a, just very briefly, there's a, a masculine side with a male king with bright light and flames and sun, and a darker side or a, a more subdued side or a more introspective side with a, a queen, a woman sitting on a, on a, on a whale, um, etc. So there's, you know, it's yin and yang again, but let's just focus on the center. Can you see there are these seven these seven rays. This is um, an image drawn for me by Oscar of the same thing. Now, these seven rays are what I want to focus on pretty much for the rest of our time together. It's one image I use a lot in the book. There are other images I use, but we haven't got time to go into them. Seven rays. So this one is, these are seven operations which the alchemists would do simultaneously on the matter they were working on and inwardly at the same time. So as they worked with their retorts and their alembics and their burnings and dissolvings, they were both working without really knowing what they were doing. Most of them, they were working on nature and themselves at the same time. It's as if nature saw them working away on matter in these sorts of ways. And, and nature gave them these operations from herself, telling them, this is how I'm constituted. This is the world, word of nature. So we've got seven operations. This is calcination or burning. This is dissolving. Um, this is separation, separating. This is conjunction, things coming together again. This is fermentation. This is distillation and coagulation. And you go round, round and round like a mandala. 
And if you do this properly, you see there's a, a, I'm afraid it's a man in the middle, but it's an alchemist. You see the triangle. It means that the insight from on high, the insight, the, the liberation of, and freedom and understanding and connection with nature comes into you if you work with this mandala. There are also these little circular pictures, um, which we probably won't have time to go into. What I want to do then, what I've done in the book, is I've gone into this mandala in some detail, particularly with these seven operations, and I've tried to relate them to um, scientific processes that we've discovered on, on the real earth, on Gaia. So I'm trying to link this image with Gaian science, basically. Notice, I just one last thing I'd like to point out, <clears throat> these words around the outside, visita interiora terra, rectificando invenies occultum lapidem, which means visit the interior of the earth. In other words, go deeply into the earth, into nature, and rectificando, putting things right, you will discover the hidden stone, the philosopher's stone, which is a state of mind, a state of consciousness in which you're fully connected to Gaia. So let's take these seven um, rays again. The first one is calcination, as I mentioned. This is burning. You burn, psychologically, you burn, burn the unhelpful things in your ego. It's very uncomfortable. Um, uh, but you have to sort of somehow burn away the things that aren't helpful in yourself. And then, this isn't working very well, this. Oh, hang on. There we go. I'll have, sorry, I just have to show you them all in one go. Then you dissolve. You dissolve what's remaining, what remains from the calcination, you dissolve it. <clears throat> you have to let go. You go into the unconscious. And the, the element here is water. Mm. You give what you've, what's been left from the calcination into the unconscious. You dissolve, dissolve, dissolve into the dream world. The green lion swallowing the sun. Your intellect is not helpful here. Then um, notice there are planets associated with each. Saturn with calcination and Jupiter with dissolution. Then the next phase, separation here, that's Mars. This is when you, you identify um, things you didn't know about yourself that suddenly appear from the, dis from the dissolution, helpful aspects of yourself. And they separate out and you begin to notice them, you identify them. You didn't know you had such good qualities or such positive as outlooks on things. You didn't know you could be so connected to nature, to Gaia. And suddenly you discover that you are, even though you're separate, you're still connected. And then there's a conjunction, which is the sun. That's this ray here. That's the sun. Um, and here your feeling and thinking come to, together inwardly. There's a, a, a combination of things that were separate. Your feeling and thinking may have been separate. They come together and you have a, a new feeling of belonging to the earth, um, which can be quite revolutionary. I've experienced it that way. A surprising way, a new form of belonging to the earth. But you think that's the end of the process, but it isn't. Because then you go into even deeper um, preparation, deeper meditation. You go into fermentation. This is to do with Venus, um, Aphrodite, beauty. And this is where inwardly you receive even more powerful inspirations about your place in Gaia, about the importance of Gaia, about what Gaia is about, about you start getting insights about how ecology really works, the inner, inner side of ecology, the inner side of relationships within all the organisms. And you take that, actually, you have to also, you have to rot down some of the material that you've got from your conjunction. You have to rot that down, let it sit, and then a new spirit comes out of that um, fermentation. And this is the distillation. You distill that, you cultivate that. The planet is Mercury. And then you move into an even deeper sense of your place in nature and of the importance of humans of nature and of, of nature herself, of Gaia herself. And finally, in coagulation, you really do feel Gaia is a Garden of Eden, even though she's been very destroyed now. You still feel her inner essence as a Garden of Eden. So this, of course, fits very well with Jim Lovelock's uh, Gaia theory, aha, uh, uh -huh, in which, as you know, if you studied with me and others at Shimha College, the idea is that all the living beings affect the rocks and the atmosphere and the water, and then they feed back to affect the living beings. And through this feedback relationship, like a tight marriage between living beings, rocks, atmosphere, and water, we get the emergence of planetary scale self-regulation, which he named after Gaia to his great credit. See, that's a sort of alchemical idea. This is like, it's as if the planet is an alchemical vessel, as I put it in the book. It's an alchemical vessel, which is going through these seven stages, these seven processes. Um, in her 
process in, uh, of self-regulation, and I would say more of self-realization. It's not just self-regulation, but self-realization. So I discuss that in the book. <clears throat> and just to come, well, we're getting close to the end. I want to now apply <clears throat> these seven processes to the evolution of Gaia through geological time. <clears throat> so this is 4 billion years ago. This is supposed to show you time, you know, coming up to the present moment, all the things that happened on the earth. This is one thing I do in the book as well. I spend quite a lot of time applying these seven rays of the Azov, the Philosoph, to um, the deep time uh, story of our planet. And so let's start with calcination. So here is an alchemical image of calcination. Look at that. Isn't that extraordinary? Here's the alchemist. He is willingly allowing himself to be put into the oven. See, there's fire here. See the fire? There's fire. There's an oven here. And there's fire coming out there. Can you see? And look what's happening. All those thoughts of all sorts of mundane things are being sort of, they're coming out of the alchemist. And there's something else going on, very peculiar going on here that we won't focus on for the time being. But you can see this is calcination, you know. And in Gaia, well, calcination might have been when the uh, planet first accreted from lumps of rock um, 4,600 million years ago, you know, after the supernova explosion, there was disk of matter flying around the sun. This isn't the sun, this is the moon, by the way. Um, and you can see all these lumps of matter formed eventually into the earth as a molten ball of rock. And here you can see uh, volcanoes emitting carbon dioxide. Those are, could they be like the thoughts in the alchemist that we saw earlier? Could that be like the thoughts? Well, this is how one thinks symbolically, you see. And of course, this heat is very much like this oven. And here's another picture of calcination. Um, right at the beginning of the story of our Earth, right at the beginning, about 4,600 million years ago. Here's the moon, also a molten ball of rock. Now, more re uh, in today's world, or starting from about, say, 3,000 million years ago, we've had plate tectonics. That's a classic calcination. Look at this. Here's the oceanic crust, all rigid and stuck in its ways, you know, like we are with our egos, stuck in our ways, stuck in our ways. And then we need to really get pushed down deep under the Earth and all that stuck material has to be molten. And it's molten here deep under the earth. Here's the calcination. It comes up and it forms continents and releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So can you see how you can begin to, uh, you can almost use the science as a kind of image to help you understand what calcination is, but it's both in yourself and in the earth at the same time. You and the earth cal have both go through calcination. Dissolution. Well, here's a lovely alchemical image of dissolution. You can see the king. The king is the ego, you could say. It has to be dissolved in the waters of the unconscious. Look how beautiful, out in nature. Look how gorgeous pictures they are. This is also from Atalanta Fujians, a series of alchemical images. So you have to dissolve that, the ego. And on the earth, in Gaia, around uh, maybe 4,000 million years ago or so, we got the water on the planet. And the water started dissolving that hardened rock by, by, of course, by this time, the molten rock had formed a crust, a solid crust of rock, and that needed to be dissolved. And the water came along and started dissolving that rock, just like an alchemical dissolution. You can see this is happening. This happened to, to me, to you. I mean, after all, you are the earth. This is your body. This is your wider body. It happened to you, and, it's hap and it, happens, it, happened to the, it happens to us psychologically. Then when we come to separation, well, in, here's another alchemical image of this time of separation. So what's happening here is this, this man has heated up the sword in the fire. He's going to split this egg in two with the sword. And look at his face. And he's full of concentration. And then maybe once he's done that, he can go down this, this great uh, tunnel into a new world. And separation in Gaia happened around 3,000, maybe 800 million years ago, when some of the chemicals that were dissolved out of the rock started separating themselves out into basic forms of, of um, biochemistry. So we've got the fats, here we've got um, the nucleotides that are going to make the DNA, and here we have amino acids that were going to make proteins, and when they all come together, they make a living cell. And that's what happens in conjunction. In conjunction is when life appears. This is the alchemical and lovely alchemical image of conjunction. You see the sun and the moon coming together, the opposites coming together. Opposites in all senses, 
you could think of positive and negative charges in some of these atoms coming together, different kinds of atoms coming together to form these molecules. It's an act of love, you see, the sun and the moon coming together. It's a beautiful image. It's conjunction. And this is what happens. Look, this is, this is life. These are bacteria just divi dividing and dividing and dividing. This is what happens in conjunction. And this happens, happened in Gaia and it happens in ourselves. When we come to life in conjunction, we become alive. We become living beings within the living body of Gaia. We realize that we're inside a larger body, which is the body of Gaia. Um, the mundanity, mundanity of, of trees and plants and birds, it fades away. They become miraculous beings that we are also part of. And it, does, it goes further because this, this conjunction wasn't just satisfied with life on its own. Different kinds of life forms, two different kinds of bacteria, um, well, one larger kind, sorry, started ingesting this smaller kind. And instead of dissolving it, they came up with a partnership. This one started living inside the ingester. That's a really very profound form of conjunction, which we call endosymbiosis. And it gave rise to the, um, to the cells that we all share now, the eukaryotic cells, the cells of plants, animals, fungi, and some seaweeds that have come together through different kinds of bacteria living within each other. That's conjunction. So you see, if you begin to um, work with these image, these, these scientific facts, um, in the way of images, and you combine them with alchemical images, you, you see what happens. It's an alchemical process. You, I think you'll find, as I hope to show in the book, that your consciousness starts to change. This has been my experience. My consciousness sort of widened out, become more Gaian. This is Lynn Margulis, of course, who also taught at the college, who, who championed this idea. And here's a living being, just for you to see the miracle of conjunction. Out of mere atoms and molecules, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, phosphorus, hydrogen. This comes out when all those atoms and molecules conjoin in the right way. Look at this living being and ourselves too. Then fermentation. This is a, a, a chem alchemical image of fermentation. It's somewhat difficult to meditate on, but here's the alchemist. He's sowing coins of gold into the ground. And these two, the sun and the moon, they have to rot down in a way. You have to, you have to, ferment something and what you ferment is their relationship between the two and this angel is is uh, maybe giving you news of a new world that's coming when, once this is happening it's announcing a new world a new consciousness which is very sharp and very discriminating you see the sword very sharp we want this to happen the alchemist wants this to happen and when it does happen this is a an image another alchemical image from the splendor solis a beautiful set of alchemical images we get the peacock's tail. We get this birth in our awareness of many different species and ecologically speaking, and how beautiful they are, how they all relate to each other. And we make music and we have culture, we drink wine, we play games, we go into the forest. This is really Aphrodite. We fall in love with Gaia now. We cultivate our love for Gaia. It's fermented, we ferment it. And on Gaia, of course, well, what does it mean, uh, fermentation? Well, it's classic, this is the carbon cycle. And what we need to do is to, we, we, we have a feedback between um, organisms that are doing fermenting, literally fermenting, bacteria fermenting in the carbon, soil carbon, uh, and also in the deep ocean sediments. They're fermenting dead bodies of photosynthesizing organisms. And the fermenters are releasing carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And the photosynthesizers on land and in the ocean are absorbing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and of course, if that CO2 weren't returned back to the atmosphere by the fermenters, by fermentation, literal scientific fermentation, the earth would freeze into a snowball. So mm, you can see how the fermentation, literal fermentation in Gaia is terribly important. And we couldn't have life as we know it without literal fermentation. And it's very much connected to the alchemical fermentation. We can start to imagine bacteria in the soil and in the sediments as fermenting beings and combine those images with alchemical images to see what happens in our consciousness. And finally, well, almost finally, distillation. This is an alchemical retort of distillation. Here's an alchemical image of distillation. So we've got various complicated things here, various liquids that are being fed into this distillation chamber with fire. Can you see there's fire here heating up the liquids and they go up and they condense and at the bottom, look what happens. You get this beautiful ambrosia coming out. How I wish we could all, every human being could drink this ambrosia. 
and become a, a, have a Gaian enlightenment. That's, that's what happens when you drink this ambrosia. And in Gaia, in the real earth, in Gaia, I see that the distillation as being this, this, this uh, setting up of food webs. And, and the, the more skillful um, manifestation of, of food webs, the food webs themselves, the relationships between all the species become more sophisticated and better at surviving. This is a scientific idea. Sorry about this, but I just want to show you this. This idea has been uh, written about in a scientific journal by a guy called Ford Doolittle. And the idea is that each of these lines is an ecological community or let's say a planet. Um, and some of the ecological communities develop great skills at being together, at working together as an ecological community. And they survive better than the ones that don't do that. And so this is a kind of natural selection through distillation, if you like. He calls it natural selection through survival alone. I call it natural selection through ecosystem distillation. See, this one here has, has some lovely distillations, become very skilled at surviving. Um, so that's distillation. And finally, we're getting close to the end, coagulation. What's that? Um, well, here's an image of coagulation, not an alchemical image. It's by Hundewasser. But you can see what my point in the book and what I'm trying to point out now is that the coagulation, uh, one aspect of it involves us. It's us coagulating into the body and into the psyche of Gaia, into the anima mundi, once again. And we can contemplate these images, these alchemical images, to help us do that. This is an image of coagulation because it has everything in it that you need to know. If you meditate on this image, the tabula smaragdina, um, with enough openness of mind and heart, uh, you can experience coagulation with Gaia very profoundly. And how can we practice what we're doing here with Gaia alchemy? How can we practice it? Well, in the book, I have various meditations and I have various suggestions of what you can do. One of the most important things is to find yourself a Gaia place. This is one of my Gaia places in our garden, uh, as wild as possible and as close to your house as possible, where you go on a regular basis. I go here as often as I can and I just sit with these trees and with these plants and I, I just meditate, I bring them an alchemical image, I bring my problems, I bring my happiness and my sadness, I just spend time in my Gaia place. When it's raining, I have an indoor Gaia place. Um, there's a Ganesh from India and a tiger from India. So if it's really pouring like now with the storms, I would probably spend most of my time indoors. And also I find it's incredibly helpful, I have found to use this instrument I invented called the Gaia scope in my Gaia place to help me connect. Now, just I read, write about this in the book, so you'll, you'll have to buy it to find out more about it and how to make your own. But you see, there's four quaternaries. There's the guy and science foursome, life, rocks, atmosphere, and waters. Then <clears throat> there's fire, air, earth, and water. These are the alchemical elements, but they're both physical and psychological at the same time. And then in the outer ring, there's intuition, thinking, and sensing. And you can move these around. And if you can, can you see this? I don't know. Here's a guy scope. Guy Oscar, my son, our son made this for me. You can move them around. And you can configure it in 64 different ways. And you can meditate on these. For example, here it says life, fire, intuiting it should be. So I would just sit in my guy place and think, or go into life, fire, intuiting in a very poetic way. What does that mean? It means something to me. Here's another nice one. Atmosphere, air, thinking. Atmosphere, air, thinking. You see, your rational mind is not helpful. It just thinks it's total nonsense, the rational mind. But if you allow yourself to go into your, your feeling and your sensing and your intuition, um, tremendous insights can happen. Look, this is a lovely one. Rocks, earth, sensing. Rocks, earth, sensing. Do the rocks actually sense the earth in some way? Do they actually sense the earth? In some way they do. All waters, water feeling. Do all the waters of the planet have an alchemical watery feeling in some sort of sense? Can you see this is beginning to raise up the anima mundi, connect you with Gaia, connect you with the anima mundi, with the soul of the earth. I call this the Gaia scope and I write about it in the book and you can make your own very easily out of cardboard. There are 64 combinations of these triplets, as I mentioned. And just to end, you, um, this is my friend Penningva Hawkland's ecosophical tree uh, from Deep Ecology. And you begin to think, okay, I've had the gyroscope. 
how am I going to, and I've done the alchemy, I'm working on alchemy. Now, how am I going to live my life? How do I live my life? And pairing vast tree, which shows us here the roots. This is our deep experiences. There are many kinds of deep experiences, or I would say Gaia alchemical experiences. I've had many, many kinds. You will have many kinds if you meditate on Gaia in this way. Then you come to, to a place where many of us who've done this kind of work and this kind of exploration, uh, we, have, we have a lot in common. And the most important thing we have in common is the insight, which we can't defend rationally, but we know with all our soul and all our heart that all life has intrinsic value, no matter its value to humans. And then Peringvar points out, we have to, and Arnie Ness would point out, we then have to choose a life path. So that's the branches. And then when we do a fruit, when we, sorry, when we do an action, that's the actual realization. And then the fruit, that's an action. And the fruit falls to the ground and fertilizes the deep experience for everyone. Now the tree is an is a, a archetypal image. Here is an alchemical image, two alchemical images of alchemical trees. In the book, I go into a description, a comparison between, or a, a comparison or a juxtaposition of Peringvar's ecosophical tree with the ancient alchemical trees. Here are the seven metals, the seven processes again. So you can read that in the book. And what would coagulation be like for humans? Well, this is Hundawasa's actual village. I think it's actually been made. Can you see how we live so close to nature? Imagine if we could all live like that in peace with nature and with ourselves. Well, that's it. There's the book. Um, I hope you can buy it and enjoy it. Um, I think that's about 20 minutes or so. So I'll stop sharing. And now I'll introduce Jules. Now, Jules is an extremely special and wonderful person. And I'm so glad that you've joined us, Jules. Thank you so much. Jules is a, a, um, a Jungian analyst of the first order. She's also written this absolute, several masterpieces. This one called Gaia, it's a very thin book, is an absolute masterpiece. I mean, it's a little booklet. Um, I'm promoting Jules's books now because I think they're worth promoting. This is fantastic. So much insight in here. Then she wrote another huge book with Anne Baring called Myth of the Goddess, um, going into the image of the goddess in many different cultures. And, she, and Jules taught on the very first course at Schumacher College with uh, James Lovelock and various other people, including me. And that's how we met. And Jules has taught many times on the MSc in holistic science, um, in depth psychology of Gaia, you could say. So now I'm going to put myself at Jules' mercy and see what she has to say or questions to ask. Jules, please, we've got about 20 minutes to do this. Okay, well, I must start with saying what an absolutely wonderful book you have written and how beautifully you explained it and explored it in, in your conversation just now. It, watching the alchemical images with you, it brought them completely to life. And it's, it's a very rare event that someone will be so eloquent and versed in, in both science and al alchemy. I mean, that is the genius of the book. It's that there are two ways of thinking in, in the collective mind that are held separate. People have looked down on alchemy from a scientific point of view for centuries. And, and now Stefan brings them together in the most miraculous way. True, true to both, so that we get all the enrichment of the earlier scientists, as it were, into our own kind of science, and both get changed. So we have a new form of science, which is what I think Stefan has given us, which is quite amazing. Because what it's doing is bringing the intellect and our, our our love for nature, but our intuition in understanding nature completely together in a new whole. We often have them both, and some experts in one aspect, another in another, but we I cannot think of any, any other book or any other person for that matter, who has brought them together, intimately woven as one in, in his own psyche. And that's the great tribute to you, Stefan. I think it's quite wonderful what you've done. Thank you, Jules. Mm. And it's just like um, the alchemists who said, 
uh, that they could not understand anything in nature unless they could understand their own human nature. And unless they transform their own psyche, they could do nothing which was worthy of, the, of, of nature. So that it had to be a union, whatever, in whichever direction it went. And I think Stefan has brought that out beautifully in his book. Because just as you're thinking, God, I, I should have learned that a bit better in science, we go straight into something which makes it completely clear through a meditation. And through through being through looking at a flower or looking at a picture, and therefore, without our knowing it, he brings them all together. So we are being taught by nature and human nature in, at the same moment, and that is just what is so exciting and what what we want from a book like Stefan has done, and like and and from Stefan himself who has earned this place by his intense study and his love for nature and, and his teaching of images. And I've rarely seen alchemy expressed and, and made available so, so clearly and passionately and, and intelligibly. It's, it's very easy to think, oh God, and not quite get there. But Stefan leads us through just in the same way as he leads us through science. And that's the genius of the book. It is a real union, I think. And so in, in a way he's, he's doing exactly what the alchemists themselves said, which was the, we have to transform ourselves before we understand anything. We cannot talk of transforming the earth or transforming any one part of the earth if, if we are not ourselves transforming at the same time, as it were, in the, same, in the same heart place. So it has to be a union. And, and Stefan has brought that into being in his book. And, and I think we will all be very grateful to you, Stefan. Thank you, Jules. So I'm now going to pester you with questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you said. OK. Um, okay. So in a sense, you've already answered them all, but mm -hmm. what moved you to write this particular book? Yeah, well, as I say, I start the book with a, um, a, a description of a dream I had. It was a dream. Um, as you know, as I mentioned at the start of my little talk, I've always had this love of science, but also this dissatisfaction with its dryness and soullessness. I've always had that even though I went through science all the way up to PhD and postdoctoral work and everything in ecology. Um, and then, of course, I was always very keen on Jung. And so I started working with a great Jungian analyst called Julian David, a great friend of both of us, Jules, who passed away recently at a very advanced age. And whilst I was working with him, I had this dream. I had many dreams. But I had one dream of this old, I, I start the book with this, an old Bulgarian peasant woman who I met on a ship and she was looking very weak and tired. And I said, oh, what's wrong with you? Uh, and she said, hold my hand, hold my hand. I, I need you, you're a scientist, I need you, I need you. I said, okay, here's my hand. And we walked off together. And she said, I think she said something like, I, I need you to help me in some way. You're a scientist, I need a scientist. Then I met her again. Um, and I said, I'm thinking of writing this book on, on alchemy and Gaia, what do you think? Said, oh yes, this is good, this is good, she said, yes. Do that, do that. It'll make me very happy. So that's why I did it. You see, from I, in other words, I got a message from the unconscious, which is the best message you one can have, isn't it? From this Bulgarian peasant woman, and I've made a drawing of her, and I've shown her the book, and she's look seems quite happy with it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, your psyche, at the deepest level, asks you to do this, and therefore is behind you all, all the way, which which is perfectly obvious when we read it. Yeah, I mean, I felt this incredible compulsion, you know. Yeah. A real compulsion. I mean, it was as if I was, I was, I was the servant. I was just the servant. Mm. I, I, there was this tremendous thing that wanted to come through, which was this union of science and guy in science and alchemy. My job was just to sit down and do the work. I was just a servant, and yeah. I, I, that was the attitude I had all the way through it. Yeah. And and that gave me a marvelous feeling of 
of the self, you could say, of the ecological self, as Arnie would say, or the self, as Jung would say, that there are greater things in the, in the of the anima mundi, that the world, re I really experience the world really is a soul. It's not just an intellectual idea, although it is that, but it's, it's a reality. That's the reality we, we live in, and our culture has forgotten how to see it. I had those experiences because of writing this book, so I'm deeply grateful to the to the anima mundi for for giving me this opportunity, you know. But my responsibility was to share it, you know. I couldn't keep it to myself. I had to share. So that's what I why I wrote the book is I have to share. If you get something like that, you have to share it. Yes, you do. And in particular, this this time when when it we are most in need of it, and perhaps people are at least looking for another way of of understanding life and understanding ourselves and why we abuse nature so totally for the most part yeah, in the right. large circumstances yes and i mean what i one thing i like about the book, book is that um it draws on our own culture western culture on on you know the do you like the, the, i don't like the word spirituality but of the awareness of the psyche of nature from our own culture from western culture we have that we tend to feel rather inferior, like, oh, you know, like Satish's culture, India, like amazing spirituality, I mean, phenomenal, or yeah. China. And of course, we must nourish and cherish those. But we have it in our own culture as well. We have it in alchemy, in our own culture. Um, the alchemists say you can find the gold in the, in the deepest rubbish. And, you know, we've considered alchemy to be rubbish. But yes. But it's got gold in it. But the, yeah. and, and now, but what's so helpful, you being a scientist, is that since it's the 17th century, the alchemists have been looked down upon. Yes. As, and it's no wonder if you think that John Locke, who's taught fervently at universities, I learned him at doing philosophy, uh -huh. said that consciousness is what passes in a man's own mind. Mm. But it was, so he completely redefined the earth who was consciousness as as we were and part of earth's consciousness he completely re redefined that and everybody qu uh, quoted him ever since mm -hmm. and that division almost became sacred because it sanctified reason and the age of enlightenment and then we got this, this great distance between us which is presumably why ultimately you have to write this book because you're bringing them back together again. And maybe some kind of distance was necessary. I mean, maybe in our earlier days, you know, as indigenous people, maybe we were so close to our mother nature that we didn't realize who we were. I don't know. I'm not so sure about that, but Jung says that kind of thing. I'm not I so know. sure. I'm not uh, so sure about it either. I'm not so sure. But anyway, the point is we went down that track of, you know, of instead of developing a holistic science, which we could have done if we if the alchemists had kept going and we'd had some some mathematics and some ideas from Galileo yeah. and you, we'd had all that as well as the alchemy, then we might have had it. We've been a different world now. But unfortunately, you know, we had Descartes and the scientific revolution that went in that direction, probably, as you know, better than me, Jules, because of the conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants in the Thirty Years War and complex political situations going on in Europe at the time. It led to this this terrible separation, didn't it? Yes. Mm. So now that's our situation. Now we have to try and put things back together again. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, can I yes. ask you a question? Please. Yeah. Um, do you think there are some, I mean, would you consider yourself an alchemist? And do you think there are some alchemists now at present time working uh, as an alchemist? Uh, or is it um, uh, uh, mainly history? No, there are contemporary alchemists. There are yes. quite a few. I know I've know a few who actually work with retorts and and metals and distillation, burning and cal burning calcining materials and um, fermenting them and distilling them. I want to start doing. I haven't started doing it yet, but I've got a little laboratory just here, and I want to start doing that. Um, am I? Am I? Am I Am I an alchemist? Yes, I think I am really. I mean, I have to say I am, even though I'm, I'm not a very good one because I haven't done any of the experiments. On the other hand, you know, I've done a lot of chemistry and my scientific training. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose I am an alchemist, but one can always cultivate it more. Yes. Um, so would you say the alchemy is um, 
a more a metaphor and, and a philosophy or is the actual uh, material transformation? Ah, no, I'm, that's a good question, Satish. Um, I think it's more philosophical, spiritual, as well as material. Okay. In other words, if, if I were to go back and say, do my A-level chemistry again with what I know now, imagine I was reincarnated and I never, I never forgot what I've learned this lifetime and I was doing my chemistry. Yeah. I would do exactly the same chemistry, you know, very rigorous scientific chemistry, but I, I would do it with an alchemical spirit. So now the, the chemicals would be living beings. They would have personalities. Yes. There, would be an aspect of, there would be an aspect of my own soul. So yes. when, I, when I merged them together in certain combinations, which I could understand mathematically, it would trigger certain dreams in me. And I would get to know the, the, the process itself would open up something in me psychologically. That's, yes. that's how you would do it if you're an alchemist, you see. Yeah. I mean, I had the kind of, I have not uh, studied alchemy, but as a, an, a, an, a lay person, I can understand alchemy as a profoundly uh, deep metaphor, transforming um, base metal into gold as a yes. metaphor. Yes, and definitely. so transforming an ordinary moment into extraordinary moment with your spiritual yes. insight. That's right. And so that I can understand, but I can't understand the actual uh, base metal being no. turned into actual gold. No, no. But more a, a kind of metaphor and, and a kind of philosophical concept. I can, like this dragon, green dragon, um, uh, capturing the sun. I can yeah. understand as a metaphor, but yeah, not yeah. as a literal, um, no. literal dragon capturing the sun as a metaphor. But in the same way, a base metal being transformed to gold is a beautiful metaphor. I can understand that. But in an actual base metal turning into gold, have more difficulty in understanding. Yeah, but you can't do that. I mean, we know now in science that you, you well, you can, you need radioactivity, it's very difficult, but you, you can't really transform lead into gold, physical lead into physical gold. No, you can't do it, or it's very difficult to do it. But you see, they didn't know that. So the alchemists, what they were doing, they were, they, they saw lead, it was both a heavy, physical metal and it was also their own leaden heaviness and they saw gold as the gold the gold that they wanted to find was spiritual gold but that that was symbolized for them in physical gold but they didn't know you couldn't do this scientifically they didn't know so if you like as jung would say they the the unconscious or the the soul of nature leapt through them out into the lead and out into the gold and it became both real and, and um, metaphysical, as you said. Or yeah. what was the word you used? Not metaphorical. 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 It became yeah. metaphorical, uh, but with an, a tremendous agency and activity which could liberate them and open up their minds to the, to the soul and reality of nature. So Will has come in. So now I guess it's time to take, take questions, right, Will? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I, I thought I'd come in. Partly because someone's just asked a question in the chat that follows on from Satish's question. So maybe okay. we'll start with that one. And there have yes. been quite a few. So we'll, right we might have to rattle through them a bit, but I'll, okay. I'll do my best. So yeah, because we're running the out one of that links to what we were just talking about there is from Tim. And he says, further to Satish's question, I wonder what, what are the ways of being of a modern alchemist? What are the ways of being a modern alchemist? And how might these enable the communicative engagement with a psychophysical world, Gaia, that you are talking about, such that our desires align with hers, as per Freya Matthews' dreamy-eyed allegiance. Oh yeah, I know Freya very well. I mean, I hate to say this, you know, I would say this because we're supposed to be promoting this book, right? So, <laughs> I would say get hold of this book and work with it and see if if that if it does anything for you because it's not just an intellectual thing, the book, and you know, I mean, the intellect is there but it's it takes it takes a back seat really it's a it's a it's a it gives you a way of cultivating this al gaia alchemical approach and you have to work with it so one thing you could do is make yourself a gaia scope not like this this is a complicated one but we you know out of cardboard I'd, I'd tell you how to do it there are meditations you've got to go through the whole book basically and use it as a, a guidebook if you like um and then you you're doing gaia alchemy you are a gaia, al gaia alchemist and I didn't, what was the thing about communication? Well, then you see, once you have, 
this experience and of course everyone on the call will be will have some sort of deep Gaia experience otherwise you wouldn't be here but this will make it hopefully it will it might not work for you I mean, I'm sure it won't work for everybody but if it if it works for you you might find new forms of communicating new forms of inspiration new forms of communicating Gaia to people you may not tell them about the alchemy side you have to use your judgment but you may find that you, you get more inspired, more inspiration from, from the above, as the alchemist would say. Or I would say from the depths of the psyche, from the anima mundi, from the unconscious. It may take you over and give you inspiration. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll, I'll, I'll read out a few more, perhaps. I'm, I'm aware that we said we'd, we'd run for an hour, but it's been so interesting. I think perhaps we can... Should we carry on a little bit longer? Is everyone? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy yeah. to if everyone else is. For a yeah. bit Brilliant. Longer. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. A few, yeah. a few more questions. A few, a few more questions. questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start with the first one that came in then, um, yeah. which is from Rene Schnitzler. And um, that's as follows What are your thoughts on the idea that the scientific revolution has been unleashed on humanity on purpose by certain forces? <laughs> certain forces? <laughs> It sounds a little bit sinister in some way. <laughs> Certain forces. Well, maybe. I mean, I think it's a shame it went that way, you know. It really, I mean, the fact that Protestants and the Catholics ended up hating each other's guts, even though they were both supposed to be followers of Jesus, who was one of the greatest ecologists ever, and would have been horrified at seeing them killing each other in his name, you know. Yeah. That was a tragedy. I mean, why did that happen? Were there certain forces? Well, maybe the certain forces in the unconscious, the dark forces, I don't know. Um, maybe. I don't like to think of the unconscious as having, well, my, Julian used to say to me, the unconscious is always trying to help you. Remember that. It's always trying to help you. So I don't know why, why this went wrong with the Protestants and the Catholics. I mean, it's, it's the shadow side of human nature. I mean, you can ask Jules. She knows these things much better than me. Don't you, Jules? Well, well, I'd just say it pitched people into an oppositional paradigm. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. And therefore brought out the, the worst in them and, and their own fears of their own integrity. Whereas if, if you go, the, the irony is, as you say, Satish, if you go back to Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, cleave a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up the mm -hmm. stone and you will find me there. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, if only they... They had discovered that earlier. Yeah, and it would be hard to fight about that. That's right. And Descartes, I th I've read, you know, was so fed up with this conflict that he wanted to have a new basis of certainty. And he, he and others thought this would be science. Well, and it, it could have been, but unfortunately, they threw out the psyche of nature, not the psyche of humans. The psyche of nature got thrown out. If I can add one or two line to yes. say that because churches and religious institutions became so dogmatic and so institutionalized that uh, people got a little fed up with it because they yeah. lost the spirituality and they became very dogmatic and very yeah. institutionalized. And so mm -hmm. science was a kind of reaction against this very dogmatic belief system. And so they said, we have to use our rationalism, rationality and pure reason, and we can't just have this belief system. So I think to some extent, this dogmat dogmatism has to be blamed uh, for scientific revolution. Yeah. And yeah. also, there's so oh, sorry, Jules, please go no, ahead. No, I'm just agreeing with Satish. It's a lovely yeah. point. Those certain for there are certain forces in the psyche. There's forces of the self, the center. You know, there is a center in the psyche, no matter what the postmodernists tell you. There is a center, you know, and we can find it in ourselves if we know how to do it. And I've learned a little bit about how to do it from Jungian psychology and from alchemy. And you can try it for yourself in this book, linking it with, with the science of Gaia. Th those are the sorts of forces you want to connect with. Yes. Shall I, shall I combine a few questions that have a similar theme here? Oh, well done, Will. That would be good. Yes. So, so I think it's generally, there's maybe three here. One from Antonio Okiza, uh, one from John Thackera, and another one from someone else, um, Sarah from France. They're all asking the similar question, which is, um, how can we how can we inspire drive change in the current educational framework, in the current scientific mm. uh, yeah. world, and and then sort of further to that, how can one get involved beyond studying at Schumacher College? So I think I feel like they they kind of come together. <laughs> Well, 
um, I'd like to hear what Satish and Jules have to say as well, but I would say you can only start with yourself. You have to start with yourself. That, I mean, that's all you've got is your own psyche, yourself. So the first thing to do is to work with yourself. That's what I try to do in writing this book and other things. So I hope this book can help you to work with yourself in a new way, you know, bringing together the alchemical images and the science. Now, after that, you have to sort of, like I showed you with the ecosophical tree, everyone has to try and find out where they can be of help, where, they, where, where, where will their life take them, where they can be of service. I was lucky that I met Satish 30 years ago, and then I had a life of service at Schumacher College. But other people have found many other ways through Schumacher College. So what am I saying? I'm saying work with yourself first to become more Gaian. Cultivate your Gaian consciousness, and this book might help you to do that. And then I would say the path, some pathway will open up for you in some way. Once you make a step in that direction, it's as if the universe kind of responds often. Um, I know that sounds a bit flaky and, and um, not terribly helpful. In education, well, come to Schumacher College if you haven't come to Schumacher College. I mean, there are other places around the world that do what we do, but not very many. I think in, in Europe, we're perhaps the only, only major one. Um, and in science, well, I'm not alone. I'm my friend, Jeffrey Keel, who I introduced you to. He's, he's a top, top class climate scientist, one of, the, one of the most senior and experienced climate scientists in the world, you know, and he's a, he's a physicist by training. Um, uh, he did very major climate science. He's a fun, also a Jungian analyst, a really skilled Jungian analyst and an alchemist. I, I couldn't have written the book without Jeffrey. He was my mentor, if you like. Um, and he's an, a very powerful scientist. He's involved in education. Maybe if we start sharing these ideas with the young scientists, I know several young scientists, very brilliant ones, who are very interested in this approach. So I think it's beginning, based on what happens with humans, it's probably going to take 200 years before this becomes a mainstream approach. We may not have 200 years. You've only got five or six years, really. Anyway, sorry, that's a bit of a rambling answer to your question. I don't know if Jules or Satish want to say anything to that. I or... can add something, uh, yeah. uh, Stefan. Mm. I agree with you that we have to be the change we want to see in the world. We have to be the radiators of change. Like a radiator yeah. radiates heat, we mm. can radiate that change. But mm. one second step, what we can do to communicate this change, you have done very well with your books. But still, we need much more communication. And many of our uh, young people who want to see the change, they need to learn to communicate well. For example, Greta Thunberg is communicating very well. She's very courageous. And that courage is needed. At the moment, we lack that courage. So cultivate your courage and speak out. Uh, speak the truth. Uh, speak yeah. truth to power. Um, and when you speak truth to power, you will have an impact. And Mahatma Gandhi had impact. Martin Luther King had impact. Nelson Mandela had an impact. You have an impact. Jews have, have an impact. So people who can speak truth to power, learn to communicate your ideas powerfully. At the moment, we are too timid. We don't communicate and we don't speak out. And that's a very important way to change. That's the second step. Be the change and communicate the change. And then thank organize you. the change. Yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. Jules, you want to say anything? No, I think Satish no. has said it all. Great. <laughs> <Right. laughs> right. So, ah, uh, perhaps we can have one more question. Um, one more question. Yeah. Okay, one more. I'll actually. I can. I think oh, I can right. combine two again. Okay, uh, one, well done. One from Tyus, uh, Tyus Matavani, and one oh, yeah. from uh, Per Espen Stockness. Oh right, uh, Per Espen. Oh good, and Tyus. Oh how lovely. And they're asking similar things. So it's basically the question is, how, well, the first question is. Has the writing process itself gone through the seven alchem alchemical phrase, uh, phases? Oh, which yes. I thought was quite nice. And then and Tyus yeah, is yeah. asking similarly, mm -hmm. do you think that Gaia is going through a systemic alchemical process? And, oh, yes. and, and we are part that's of Gaia realizing. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Definitely. No, um, I did go through and uh, the writing of this book, those seven processes. Absolutely. Yeah. Calcination, you know, I had to tear up, I had to go through, it was very hard, you know. Had to had to burn away lots of stuff in myself and also throw away lots of drafts, which I didn't think were any good. Then I had to dissolve. I had to let myself dissolve in what the book wanted. I had to dissolve. 
into the unconscious and pay attention to my dreams and pay attention to that Bulgarian peasant woman that came in my dreams. Then I had to separate things out, realize what's useful, what's not useful in this book, which image to use, which image not to use. Then I had to let things come together. Once I'd separate, seeing what was separate, they had to coagulate into the idea for the book, the flow of the book, the chapters in the book. Once I had that, I had to ferment it. I had to let it rot. This first idea had to rot. And then I had to, new ideas had to come up, new ways of doing had to come up. And then I had to distill all of that. And then when I was writing it and working very hard on it and putting it all together, then it coagulated. Well, this is the coagulation of it. That's it. That's coagulation. Yeah. And then I haven't stopped. I'm still working on now. I'm in another process now, um, you know, the going around the seven rays again. And I hope it's never going to stop for the rest of my life. Um, and also beyond when my life ends, I hope it continues as well. And then about Gaia. Yeah, we're, we're doing, we're calcining Gaia. Before Western culture did what it's done to the planet, Gaia was in a fine state of coagulation. Really amazing. I mean, incredible, sophisticated ecosystems. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, 4, 000, I mean let's say 4,600. Now, let's say life started, let's say 4,000 million years ago. It's taken 4,000 million years for Gaia. It took her that long to get to that state of coagulation. And I think she needed our human consciousness. So she, she needs human consciousness. And she wanted something like our consciousness. But it's a risk creating a sort of Western style consciousness. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be going very well because we're calcining her. We're burning her. We're heating her. And we're, we're putting her back thousands of millions of years. So we're putting her into a calcination that she doesn't like. So that's part of her alchemical process. But unfortunately, she's going to dissolve us. She's going to dissolve us. She doesn't like, she won't tolerate it. She'll dissolve us either with war, plague, climate change. We've got those three things almost now together. Um, this is what she does, you see. And she'll put us through, she'll go through a calcination and hopefully we'll come out okay at the other end, possibly. Good. That's a very good answer. Um, so I think we have to bring to a close this session. Yeah. Uh, it's nearly a uh, quarter to nine. Uh, but I would like to thank uh, Stefan, not only for writing the book, but presenting it this evening so clearly, so succinctly, and so uh, beautifully. And it's very, and you have made it very clear and more accessible. Uh, it sounds like alchemy, very difficult to know, difficult to understand. Science, also difficult to understand. But you have made it accessible. And, and I could hear every word you're speaking so clear. That's a, a great skill. Um, and you have done it. So I would like to thank you for writing the book and, and articulating the book um, this evening and introducing the book. And I very much hope that um, most of our listeners this evening will be inspired by your talk and they will go out. And there's a link there in your chat box uh, how to get a copy of the book. Uh, they will go out and get, get a copy and read it and then maybe come to Schumacher College and meet you in person and, and have a, a personal dialogue with you and conversation with you. So thank you very much for doing that. And also I would like to thank Jules for uh, uh, engaging in this conversation and, and a kind of dialogue with you. And, and so thank you, Jules, what, what your lifelong work you have done on Gaia and alchemy in your own way um, and your writings and your teachings at Schumacher College, but also around the world and around Great Britain has been most marvelous. And so thank you very much for your lifelong achievement and what you have done and your friendship with Stefan and working together with Stefan and teaching at holistic science courses. And also I'm grateful to know you and have you as my friend. So thank you very much, uh, Jules. But I would also like to thank Will, um, Will Kemp who has organized this technological uh, and coordinated this um, uh, Zoom conference and a webinar so that we could smoothly do it because I'm a techno novice. I don't know how these things work, but Will has been able to coordinate without any hitch, without any problem, and the whole event has gone very smoothly. So thank you, Will, very much for your wonderful help and support. 
And last but not least, I would like to thank all the people who have joined this evening in this conversation and dialogue and ask questions. And even if you didn't get the answer, the chance to ask questions, you have stayed there and listened to uh, Stefan and Jules and, and paid attention. And so thank you very much for spending your time and coming to this event. So the book is launched and, and now the book is out in the world. And please go out and buy it and read it and be inspired and, and, and go in depth uh, to these values. Thank you all. And with these words, I would like to say the, uh, the session is over. Do you want to play a bit of music? I'll play a little end? bit of music and then we can yeah, sign okay, off. Please do that. Thank you. And, yeah. Thank you, Satish. And thank you. Thank you, Jules. And thank you, Will. I won't repeat what Satish said, but thank you so much. It's been wonderful that you can join us. Mm -hmm.